I'm Tori Bedford. Tonight on Greater Boston, once Donald Trump's main competitor, Ron DeSantis, is now out of the race for president. Where does this leave Nikki Haley, and where does Trump stand now? Boston Public Radio's Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan join me. Plus, Newton teachers strike for a second day. How'd we get here, and how long will this go? The head of the town school committee and one of those teachers on the picket line will join me. Nikki Haley has been gunning for a one-on-one -on -one race with Donald Trump for the Republican nomination. And now that Ron DeSantis has dropped out, she finally has one, with just a day to go before the polls close in the New Hampshire primary. But Donald Trump is still close to 20 points ahead of Haley in the latest poll. At this point, is there any chance she can close the gap? Boston Public Radio hosts Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan join me now from Manchester to weigh in. Thank you both so much for being here. Thanks for joining us. Our pleasure, Tori. Happy to be here. So what's the energy? I mean, I've been there with you. You've covered a million of these. Usually it's really kind of chaotic in Manchester. Like, I've seen people live blogging down the street, people in costumes, protests, rallies. Like, there's so much energy around this. What is it like this year? It's kind of a weird year. I would say the energy level is cut in half considerably. I mean, there are more people up here today, but it's not like it was before where you'd see the candidates walking around the hotel here, where you'd see the, all the famous network anchors walking around the hotel. It's much more subdued. Well, with one exception, you were outside the Trump rally the other night. People were standing in line for four hours oh, in yeah. teen uh, temperatures Freezing. to get in to see Donald Trump. So I would say the energy level for Trump right. appears to be typical energy had, level for Trump. I had frostbite just waiting <laughs> in line with them for like a half an hour. They were out there for hours. I don't know how they did it. I've noticed the same people each year. So the first year I went, I met these people who were out there in full snowsuits in their tents with like the propane heaters. And then the second year I came back and they offered me hot chocolate. They were like, oh, you were here from last year, right? Like, well, how was, tell us more about the Trump event. I know you were just in line, right? You didn't actually go in, but that's the real event, I think, is that line and the energy of that crowd. Well, our colleague, uh, Aidan Conley, went in there, and he was put in the reporter's pen. He had to go in at like 3.30 or 4 o'clock for a rally that started at 7, so he had a long wait inside. But it, he said the energy there was huge, thousands of people, and every time the president, former president, I should say, mentioned something about the media, all these thousands of people turned around, and they looked right at Aidan, and they, they booed and hissed. <laughs> but, you know, uh, Tori, there's not nearly enough attention paid to what Trump said at a rally, I think it was the night before, when uh, Donald Trump, who goes out of his way at every opportunity to say Joe Biden is too old, crooked Joe Biden, as he would say, is too old to be president of the United States, the guy, for a significant period of time, Donald Trump, confused Nancy Pelosi and Nikki Haley when he was saying he offered 10,000 troops, which is also not true. He meant to say Nancy Pelosi, but said Nikki Haley. That's troubling, and I, that's really troubling for those who are concerned about the age of Joe Biden. I would suggest they look at the other side of the aisle. There's some serious issues there. Well, that's something that Nikki Haley has really been emphasizing, too. She's been talking a lot about his age. I think what's been surprising and, you know, it's kind of, been kind of a both slow... Both of their age. Right, both of their age. What is your perception right now of her? I know she kind of snuck up, and I think you, you'd mentioned this on, on Talking Politics, that you're really... You know, it's hard to, to make predictions right now, but it looks like she's doing really well, at least in New Hampshire. Well, the polls suggest she's not. The polls suggest the most recent polls, with one outlying poll, which had her tied last week, American Research Group, 40-40 with uh, Trump. The polls that came out today, CNN had her 16 points down. I think Suffolk, uh, David Pelagos had her 19 points down. The point I was trying to make, and I'm not one of those people say, oh, I was never polled, so they're illegitimate. Polls are generally pretty accurate these days. However, uh, New Hampshire voters, Tori, are pretty contrarian types. And I think most people agree that if Trump wins, particularly if he wins by more than a little here, the Republican primary is over after Iowa and New Hampshire. And I'm not sure that New Hampshireites want to uh, be part of that. Now, I may be dead wrong, and the polls suggest I am, but I think that may be Haley's best choice. Do you buy that or no? Well, I, I think if you talk about energy levels and, and who knows how indicative those are, but I mean that people were at the Nikki Haley rally. It was very kind of calm. The room filled up slowly. We're talking a few hundred people. And as you mentioned before, I didn't see any propane tanks yesterday, but there were people 
by the thousands outside waiting in all these hours. And you ask them about the 91 indictments. You ask them about the E. Jean Carroll uh, civil liability for sexual assault and defaming. They don't believe it's true. About, did or don't care. Or, well, most of them said they didn't believe it. Was really? Least, yeah, they didn't believe it was true. Uh, or even that the election was won by Biden. So you have a very cult-like following there for the former president. And... Um, with an incredible amount of devotion and enthusiasm. I know there were studies that came out during tr the Trump presidency that showed that when you present people with facts, often people become more reinforced in their beliefs. And I think that was shown in a lot of, so I'm not sure, I mean, that's, it's, an, it's an energy and an environment and you can ask about it, but having those conversations about facts never really seems um, to go anywhere. It's, it's strange. I don't know, I think, do you, do you feel that you could be right now, we talked a little bit about the energy of this, of this event, but do you feel that you could be at the last ever New Hampshire primary? I mean, the DNC is, is you know, has made their decision, is this it? Well, Tory doesn't mean the end of democracy. That's why you're laughing. But one of our she texters actually did say this, that if Trump wins, this will be the last primary ever, ever, Anywhere. ever. Yeah, so but go ahead. No, but, uh, you know, uh, the point that was made, who made this point to us? Chuck Todd mm -hmm. from NBC, the political division. He runs it, was with us. And he mentioned, he said it might be the last uh, primer here, not for the reason's end of democracy, hopefully, but because uh, of both Iowa and New Hampshire, which assumedly, if, if Trump wins, the Republican governors in those state, Kim Reynolds and Sununu, endorsed other people, DeSantis in Iowa, uh, Haley here. Why would he want to deal with these places? And his point, this is Chuck's, Todd's point, is how about Alabama? How about a deep red state where Trump is uh, beloved, sort of like how Joe Biden is beloved in the first primary state, South Carolina. And so I would say that uh, that the future of uh, New Hampshire is not only hanging, but well, it's already lost the Democratic first in the nation. I'd say the likelihood of it being the Republican first in the nation ever again is virtually nil. I wanted to just quickly, you know, we don't have a ton of time. I wanted to get back to Ron DeSantis uh, dropping out. Uh, this is a, we have a clip from DeSantis um, on NBC News, and he was talking about how, he was criticizing Trump here, talking about how he would accept anyone who would kiss the ring. It's almost like with, with Donald Trump, if you don't kiss the ring, you could be the best governor ever and he'll trash you. You could be a terrible, corrupt politician, but if you kiss his ring, then all of a sudden he'll praise you. So he's turned around, obviously, you know, he's turned around and endorsed Trump. Do you see a similar path for, for Nikki Haley? Or what are people saying about that? Well, Haley has said, not only Haley, but Sununu, who's been outwardly critical of Trump incredibly, both Haley and Sununu have said, if Trump is the nominee, they'll vote for him. So, so much for Donald Trump being unfit to be president in their estimation. They're loyal to their party candidate, even if the guy is accused of 91 felonies, found liable for sexual abuse, found to be a perpetrator of fraud. Apparently, that does not matter, even to those who are running against them, Tori. They said that they thought she would hang in because you don't know what's going to happen with these indictments. And if the president is, former president is found guilty of some of these things, that might change some votes. So she may be waiting in the wings and hoping something happens bad for the president in one of these criminal cases. By the way, the rumor is, I haven't seen it yet, when DeSantis did kiss the ring, he kissed the ring in those white rubber boots of his that are so... <laughs> so appealing so who knows he always know. has a heel uh we have about a minute left i wanted to get to something really important just in in on the subject of of not always seeing what's coming um marjorie experienced a bit of a, a moment of shock um we have we have a clip Go ahead. That was I banging into twas the wall I. several times uh, when I was a little bit confused about it. You see the glass walls behind us? Well, they're so well cleaned and Windex, I thought that perhaps I was walking straight to Jim. It was not the case. Mm. But look at her. She's fine. I survived. No harm, no foul. That's what we say here up in New Hampshire. It can be difficult to see things even when they're right in front of you, you know? 
But Jim, I, I wanted to mention exactly. just, you know, you've That's been absolutely. you've been ragging on Marjorie about this all day. And is it not true that you drove interstate travel because your hotel neglected to refill your coffee pods? So you came all the way home and then went back to New Hampshire in a 24 hour period? <laughs> I will neither confirm I will neither confirm nor deny the truth of yes. that, Tori. So nice try. Mm -hmm. They refilled mine, Tori, at the front desk. <laughs> worked out very well. Okay, well, as long as it worked out and you got your coffee pods. All right, thank you both so much. Um, thank you for joining us. Great to see you, Tori. Thank thanks. you. Chester, thanks. Finally tonight, Newton schools were closed again today as the city's public school teachers strike for higher pay and other improvements in benefits and working conditions to discuss where negotiations stand, how long the strike might last, and what this all means for students and their families. I'm joined now by David Bedar, a member of the Newton Teachers Association who's taught history at Newton North High School for 17 years. David, thank you so much for joining us. So we're talking, I mean, this is having a, a huge impact. We're talking nearly 2,000 educators. You know, you've been working working without a contract since August. Where are we at now? Why has this taken so long? What are kind of the biggest sticking points that are delaying this, these negotiations? Sure, well, thanks for having me. Um, start by just saying, yeah, not only have we uh, not had a contract since it expired, but we've been negotiating, or at least trying to negotiate uh, since October of 2022. Uh, just to make sure that year year is picked up correctly, it's 2024, so that's that's not good. Um, what are the major uh, sticking points? I would say first and foremost is uh, Mayor Ruth Ann Fuller is the biggest sticking point. Um, but I can tell you about our priorities and what we're what we're looking for. They really haven't changed uh, at all in the last 16 months. We are looking for uh, we're looking for the following. We're thinking. Um, uh, mental health support. Our students are in a mental health crisis, so we're looking to get a social worker in every elementary and middle school and the Newton Early uh, Childhood Program. We're looking at um, getting a reasonable uh, cost of living adjustment. And some of the discourse, you mentioned it kind of right off the bat as, as the main thing. Um, and that is how it's often sort of depicted is that this is about pay. It's about pay in, in part as far as reasonable cost of living adjustments um, in line with uh, with inflation. But that is by no means the entirety. If folks are really paying attention to the news uh, and and being critical consumers of information, hopefully they're sifting through some of the, the rhetoric coming uh, from the mayor's office and the school committee to actually listen to educators and students and parents and community members at events like the big rally we had today, uh, hundreds and hundreds of people at one o'clock. Um, it's a lot more than the cost of living adjustments. Those are important, but we're looking for a living wage for unit C members. Those would be uh, sometimes called paraprofessionals or education support professionals um, who do not, you know, $27,000 is not a living wage, uh, in our opinion. Um, school committee, by the way, rejected um, uh, that counter offer of, uh, of, of raising pay for unit C folks. They rejected the wage increase, did not offer a counter proposal. Um, what else? We are looking for parental leave that is more uh, in step with what it should be in 2024, more humane, uh, modern family leave policies. We are looking for um, increased student learning supports, everything that we've been saying, you know, it feels like uh, uh, sometimes over the last few days, at least, um, I think to our entire membership that the school committee and the mayor don't know there's a strike happening and don't understand that we're in a crisis. Um, and, you know, this doesn't have to be the case. We all want to get back into the classrooms as soon as possible. Um, but that's that's up to the mayor. Uh, I mean, she has the money and needs to fund the schools fully. Right. You mentioned those paraprofessionals. Those are also that includes behavioral therapists, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the starting wage is is twenty seven thousand um, dollars. So there are behavioral therapists, but you're talking about specific professional bringing in additional specific professionals and then paying those more as well. And that's been one of the big sticking points in the contract. Right. Well, so we're talking about a uh, living wage for uh, classroom aid, special, you know, folks that work with special education students, uh, instructional aides, behavioral therapists. Yes. In addition to um, hopefully getting a social worker uh, that that is very needed in our schools, particularly among our youngest and most vulnerable students. Um, these are folks that work really, really hard 
and uh, have often thankless tasks and are vital to the operations of our schools. And they really make the schools run in many ways. And, you know, in a city like Newton that is affluent, that has uh, has the money to pay folks and claims that, uh, you know, the mayor claims that public schools are, you know, her top priority. Well, she's got to act like it. Um, and frankly, the school committee uh, can only do, I, I feel for them sometimes in the sense that they are hamstrung by the mayor. So they should be standing up to her, not, um, you know, pushing back on things that are going to be good for kids. We say it all the time, and it's not just just to say that student learning conditions are the same as our working conditions. This is this is what we're what we're fighting for. There's a reason why students are out there, you know, independently. I, I've been hearing from alumni that I taught, you know, ten years ago, twelve years ago, reaching out and offering um, expressions of support that this will get resolved quickly. You know, I'm right there with them. So it is illegal for teachers in Massachusetts to strike. And on Friday, a Middlesex uh, Superior Court judge kind of gave you a warning that if you didn't stop by Sunday, there would be legal ramifications. You know, it's continued. So what is your response to that? Yeah, it's continued because we are trying to do what's right by our students and for the education in the city of Newton. Um, you know, the mayor can end this right now if she wanted to uh, by fully funding the schools. But we are prepared to uh, to pay fines where we believe what we're doing is is right. We believe we're doing right by the students of Newton. Um, you know, yeah, it's illegal. This is an act of civil disobedience, but we're proud to stand up for our students uh, and our families. Uh, the community, community is behind us. We've seen that um, at the rallies, at, at the standouts. Um, they've been with us and, you know, we're trying to stand up for the right thing in a way that elected leadership in Newton either doesn't have the will to do or is too afraid to do. I, you'll have to ask them that, but, um, we're going to hold out longer, uh, you know, one day longer than the school committee will. You mentioned how Newton is very well funded. I mean, as a town, the teachers are some of the highest paid in the state. I think that's a lot of people's reactions just in 30 seconds. Can you just tell me, you know, when people tell you that, well, isn't it enough? Like, what could you possibly be striking over? What is the mission here? Yeah, as I said before, you know, uh, I, what I would say to those folks is that education support professionals are not actually being paid a living wage that shows any level of respect and value for the really, really hard work that they do. Um, inflation has hit everyone, of course, and we're just like everybody else asking for, you know, reasonable uh, these are certainly not outrageous proposals, but reasonable cost of living adjustments. You know, the the city uh, was at twenty eight million dollars in surplus free cash. Um, they've already been cutting programs. Mayor Fuller has cut programs the last several years. They're trying to have us subsidize education in Newton, and we're saying no. Um, you need to fully fund the schools. That's your job. You're elected to lead. So lead. Great. Well, David Bedar, thank you so much. Obviously, this is an ongoing story. We'll be on top of it, but uh, keep in touch. And thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Now to break down how the Newton School Committee is responding, I'm joined by their chairman, Chris Brezky. Chris, thank you so much for being with us. So this is, you know, this is not happening in a vacuum. Obviously, these negotiations have been going on for over a year. Teachers have been without a contract since August. And now this strike is, has come to a head and you're kind of in the middle of it. Um, what, what is really, what's the holdup, right? Like what is keeping students out of school and um, what's kind of, what are kind of the sticking points here in terms of these negotiations? Yeah, so, um, you know, as you said, this, is, this has been going on for well over a year. Um, you know, the, the pace of negotiations has, has been slow through, through much of that time. Um, we did enter into state mediation um, back in the summer, when, uh, which is a process you, you enter into um, when you reach an impasse. It's a, it's a sort of well-known process that's intended to bring the two sides together and, and reach a conclusion and, and avoid something like this from happening. Um, and, you know, I mean, th that's, that's not to be lost here, what the impact of this is. You know, this, this, is, this is kids being shut out of schools again after, you know, only a couple years removed from the pandemic. Um, you know, I, I, have, I have two kids in the, in the Newton Public Schools. I have an elementary student and a, and a middle school student. And 
I mean, this is this is devastating to go through as a parent. Um, so, you know, in, in terms of the the issues, you know, there's really there's really four major variables in the negotiation, which are compensation and the cost of living adjustments that our teachers will get. Uh, it's benefits, it's parental leave, and it's the need for the district to have the flexibility to be able to provide the services that our students require in 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 the way they need to receive them. And you know, we we are still negotiating on all four of those points, unfortunately. Right. We we spoke to to David Bedar um, of the Newton Teachers Association, and he. You know, he he mentioned how he said teachers really want to be with their students. They didn't want, you know, a strike is a last resort to get to this point. But a couple of, of their sticking points, which you also just mentioned, have been rejected, including um, raising the starting wage for, for Unit C employees, so the paraprofessionals who help with behavioral health and things like that. That was rejected. Um, you know, he said that, that the cost of living raises haven't been commensurate with the cost of living in Newton or in the nearby area. How do you respond to, to that? Obviously, this has just been a back and forth, and there hasn't been really, despite the mediation, you know, you haven't been able to come to an agreement. You know, how do you respond to that? And what is the thinking behind those, the rejection of, of those proposals? Yeah, so um, in terms of the cost of, um, the cost of living, I guess I'll, I'll address that first, because that's sort of a very big picture issue. And, you know, look, I, I won't dispute that, um, you know, the, the increase in compensation for those folks who only receive a COLA, not necessarily for those folks who are still working their way up the salary table, but for those folks who only receive a COLA, it has not kept pace with inflation for the last couple of years. That's, that's a reality. Guess what? That, that's true for most everybody in America. You know, municipal governments in Massachusetts are, are not built for 8% interest rate environments. That's, that, that is what it is. Um, and, and we don't dispute that. But if you look back across the, the average tenure of an NPS employee, they actually have kept pace with inflation. Even for those folks who only receive that COLA adjustment to their salary, they have kept pace with inflation. And that's because they were receiving COLA adjustments of you know two plus percent for many years when inflation was you know practically zero, and so there's been this catch up and and that's a really difficult thing to go through, um, and we we don't we don't deny that there's a there's a you know that's a real impact on on our our folks who who work for our kids, um, in terms of uh, in in terms of the unit C folks you referenced. And I mean, me, my family lives Unit C. We have um, we have a lot of contact with those folks as a parent, and they do, I mean, honestly, uh, amazing work for our kids. Um, you know, I, I said it the other night in, in the negotiating room that you go into a meeting with 12 people and, and you're spending 90 minutes just doing nothing but talking about how are we gonna do what's in the best interest of your kids. And, you know, it's kind of heartbreaking to see this happen now. Um, but we came into the negotiation as a committee saying, you know what, we need to do better on that, on that bottom entry level for those folks. That was a strategic goal of ours. And we came to an agreement to drop the, uh, the, the, the bottom two steps off the chart, so to speak, so that people coming in will have a, a sort of step function higher raise um, than, than otherwise would be. I would also say, while you know we're now moving that into the competitive realm because we felt we were, you know, we were low, we were low before before 20, we put that proposal. Yeah, twenty-seven thousand to start is relatively low. I mean, especially for Newton, right? So, what did you propose as a as a higher wage? Um, in terms of what the actual number is, I don't have that handy. I can certainly get that for you, um, but you know, we are hyper competitive at the top end of unit C. So we pay the best wages if uh, certainly amongst our peers, it might be in the state. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, you know, if, if there's a, you know, restructuring of that to level that somehow, I don't know, like, you know, 
we haven't heard them bring that forth as a proposal. Um, so if you look across the contract as a whole, though, it's it's hard to say what's on the table is not competitive. We have looked at their selected peer groups and use their methodologies that they have published. And their peer groups are, you know, much smaller towns, less diverse, um, you know, wealthier in many cases. And we are the median of those peer groups if you look at their selected metrics. So it's just hard for me to say that an offer that makes you the median isn't competitive. You mentioned the pandemic. I think it highlighted a lot of the importance of teaching, a lot of the difficulties that educational professionals face. And I think it also has created an environment where children need more support, right? I think you have children in Newton Public Schools need more behavioral health support, need social workers perhaps, which is one of the things that they're asking for in the contracts. I mean, do you think that Newton has the ability to step up and provide these things or meet at the table at this time when teachers are saying, hey, we need more. Yep. So, I mean, what you're saying is is correct in the sense that it, it is different. It, it is just different. Schools are not even recognizable, you know, to what they were 10 or 15 years ago. But even five years ago, before the pandemic, things are different. The level of needs of kids is just so much higher. And I live that every day as a parent. And, you know, the, um, you know, the, the, the proposals around things like social workers are things that we're addressing. So when Dr. Nolan was hired and started back in July, the first thing she did was come in and say, I need to take an audit of this whole district. I need to, I need to, you know, take a look at fresh with fresh eyes. What are the, what are the most critical needs of this district? And she identified a couple of things. We need to bring our class sizes down in some of our high school math and STEM classes. And another priority was we need to put in incremental supports, including social workers, at five of our elementary schools that need it the, the absolute most. Those were her two biggest priorities in terms of how we're going to invest in this district going forward. And so that plan included adding five social workers on top of the 105 social workers, counselors, psychologists, et cetera, that are already in our schools doing that work. Chris, I'm sorry. I wish we had more time to talk about this. Um, Thank you so much for your time. I know the story is ongoing. These issues are still very much happening. Um, thank you. Thanks for joining us and, and keep us posted, okay? Thank you. Thanks, Chris. That's it for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow with more coverage on the New Hampshire primary. I'm Tori Bedford. Thanks for watching. Good night.